Well, morning Valley Church. Morning. No, you can do better than that. Morning Valley Church. Morning. And to those watching online, I want to hear you. Morning Valley Church. Well, that's not going to happen. Well, now everyone's loose this morning and I uh, can't believe it. At quarter past eight this morning, there were three people in this church. How did you guys all arrive without me knowing about it? <laughs> Warm welcome to one and all those joining us online around the world. Uh, if you suffering in the cold of the Northern Hemisphere, well, we've been sweltering in the heat of the Southern Hemisphere the last few days. But it's so good to be in the house of the Lord this morning and just to worship the Lord. And uh, yeah, just to be in fellowship, to be part of family, because that's what... This is all about. So very warm welcome to any visitors that we might have with us this morning. Very warm welcome to you as well. Uh, God's got a word for us this morning. Starting a new series that's going to take uh, us through the next few months. And as I just waited on the Lord earlier this week, it, it really the Lord just gave a very clear message of, of what He wants to speak into our lives over the next few months. Uh, there aren't too many announcements. Uh, things are back to normal. We have Adventure Church going. And uh, we are going to be making some announcements at the end of this month about the way forward uh, in terms of uh, online ministry and meeting here at church. And, uh, but I'm not going to say too much about that at the moment, uh, but we will be making announcements a little bit later uh, in, this, uh, in this month. I'm going to ask Meg to join me, and she's just going to pray a blessing over us this morning. I really hope that uh, the Holy Spirit's been ministering into your heart as we've worshipped. There were some beautiful, just beautiful statements there about Jesus being enough. And I really just trust that even as, as Grant preachers, there would just be a, the Holy Spirit ministering into your life that He is enough for everything. Um, and particularly as you just kind of look to this new year and what God has for you, that He is enough even for that. So let's pray together. Father, I thank you this morning that uh, we can just rest in that place that you are in us. We can, we can take just such a, um, we, we have such a sense of security in the fact that you are in us. And so we thank you this morning that as grand preachers, as we just open our hearts to your word, that there would be a sense of you ministering personally into each of our lives. Um, so we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I'm going to be uh, preaching a series through the book of 2 Corinthians uh, that's going to take, I don't know how long, uh, it's going to take until we finished. And uh, I'm really excited about the title of the series is Never Give Up. Never Give Up. And I really believe that that is God's word for us in this season. Giving up Valley Church is not an option. Never give up. So if you have your Bibles with you this morning or your Kindle or your uh, telephone or whatever you use to read God's Word. Let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and we're going to look at the first uh, 11 verses uh, of our uh, 2 Corinthians chapter, chapter 1. Paul writes as he begins this amazing book and he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God in Corinth together with all his holy people throughout Achaia, Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. If we are distressed, it is for your comfort and salvation. If we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which produces in you patient endurance of the same sufferings we suffer. And our hope for you is firm, because we know that just as you share in our sufferings, so also you share in our comfort. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles we experienced in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. 
He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and He will deliver us again. On Him we have set our hope, and He will continue to deliver us as You help us by Your prayers. Then many will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favour granted us in answer to the prayers of many. When I was a, a teenager, I didn't particularly enjoy school. Uh, it was just one of those things. But there was something that I enjoyed in school, apart from playing rugby and cricket and all those good things. I loved history. For some other reason, I enjoyed history. And what I particularly enjoyed about history was the history of the Second World War. For some other reason, it just gripped me, it fascinated me. And I would read book upon book about the events around the Second World War. And as a result of that, I developed a, a real fascination with the person of Winston Churchill. And he really became one of my heroes as I considered this, this man who had all his faults and all his failings. And yet, in what he described as Britain's darkest hour, cometh the hour, cometh the man. And God raised up a man like Winston Churchill, who perhaps is one of the few people in, our, in the history of mankind who actively change the course of history as we know it today. And truly he was God's man for the moment. And, and one of the ways in which he was able to galvanize the British people was through his speeches. And, and we know those, those famous speeches of we'll fight them on the beaches, we'll fight them on the landing strips. We, I offer you nothing but blood, sweat and tears. And through those amazing motivational speeches, he was able to galvanize the British people. But in one of those speeches, he, he asked the, the question, he said, what is our policy with regards to this war? And then he answered that question with a very simple statement. And he simply said, we will never, 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 never give up. What has become known as the British Bulldog. That stubborn desire to prevail came from that simple philosophy. Failure is not an option. We will never give up. And friends, I want to say to you as we begin 2022, in two months time we will, I dare, dare I say we will celebrate, but we will remember the beginning of lockdown two years ago. And this has been a war of attrition for many people. And even as we come to the end of this last wave, and hopefully there's not going to be another wave, what we do know is that COVID is going to be with us forever. We will continue to be challenged by the difficulties and the challenges of life. And as we come to the end of the season, as we can look ahead to what lies ahead, there are many who have come to a place in their journey with God and in their faith who are tempted to give up. To give up on their dreams and their hopes. To give up believing the purposes and plans that God has spoken into their lives. Many are at the place in which they want to give up. As Paul writes to the church at Corinth, the context is that he and Timothy had been to visit them. These are Jewish believers who fled out of Jerusalem to far countries because of persecution. They planted churches, but the New Testament church was a difficult church. It was under persecution. They were going through difficult times. And as Paul visited them, it was a very difficult visit. They, they questioned his authority. They rebelled against him. It was a divided church. It was a church going through great difficulty. And Paul now writes his second letter to them. And basically what he's saying is this, guys, don't give up. And as we unpack this book over the next few weeks and the next few months, I want to explore what God says about the reasons why we should not give up. Because that's the question that is in your heart this morning. Well, Grant, you say, don't give up, but why should I not give up? What is the reason that I should not give up? Well, very helpfully, right at the beginning of this book, Paul gives to us four keys to overcoming, which is the title of my message. 
Four keys to overcoming. Four keys that if we understand them and we practice them, we will not fall into the trap and the temptation of giving up. So Valley Church and those watching online, let's begin this amazing series. And we need to understand these four keys of overcoming if we're not going to fall into the trap of giving up. So let's begin with the first one, which is found in verses 3 to 5. The first thing we need to understand is simply this, that God's empowering is always greater than any challenge we will face. God's empowering is always greater than any challenge we will face. Paul writes in verses 3 to 5, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles, so that we may comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves have received from God. For just as the sufferings of Christ flow into our lives, so also through Christ our comfort overflows. There are three things, three statements that Paul is making here. The first one he's making is simply this, guys, trouble and difficulty and challenge in life is a normal part of life. So accept it. Don't try and understand it. Don't try and analyze it. It is simply a part of being in the fallen world that we live in. Difficulty and challenge is a reality. It's what Jesus said to the disciples when he was about to leave them. In John chapter 16 and verse 33, what did Jesus say? He said, guys, in this world you will have trouble. In the 25 years I've been in ministry, as I've ministered and counseled with people who are going through difficult times, I've been amazed at how they spend so much time and energy trying to understand why they are going through this trial. And sometimes questioning, is God punishing me? Am I being treated unfairly? Nobody else seems to be going through this. I want to say to you, what you are going through, others are going through, have been through, and in fact, Jesus went through. Every trial you face, Jesus went through. And we'll see a little bit later in the passage that every trial Jesus went through, we will go through because His suffering flows into our lives as inconvenient as that may seem. So Paul says trials and difficulties are a normal part of life. So don't waste your time analyzing. Don't believe the lie that God is simply punishing you because of what you are going through. I mean, Paul himself was perhaps one of the godliest men of his age, a man who was the greatest missionary the world had known. If ever there was someone who needed and know, would have known God's favor, it was him. And yet Paul goes on in the Passion and he says, Guys, look at the trials we went through. We came to the point where we felt like we were about to die. And so friend, if you are going through deep waters, if you're going through difficult times at the end of this pandemic season, I want to say to you, Welcome to the club. That is just the reality of life. The second point that Paul is simply making, and it's what I alluded to earlier, and it's found in verse 5, is that the trials and the sufferings that Jesus went through flows into our lives. What does Paul say? For just as the sufferings of Christ flow over into our lives, so through Christ our comfort overflows. There are two key words in that verse that you need to focus on. Flows and overflows. So what is Paul saying? Paul is saying because trials and difficulty are a reality in the world, and because as Christ follows, we follow in His footsteps, what Christ suffered and the challenges of life will flow into our lives. And we will experience the difficulty that comes with it. That's the first part of the picture. The second part of the picture, what does Paul say? In response to that, he says, through Christ, God's comfort doesn't simply flow into our lives, but it overflows. What does Paul say? 
The word comfort is, un- is an unfortunate word that Paul uses there. It's not simply an emotional comfort that God gives. It's not simply emotional support. But that word comfort speaks of empowering and equipping. And so what Paul is simply saying is, the reality is, is that difficulty and challenge and trial and grief and loss and everything that you have experienced in this season will flow into your life. But what will overflow in your life is God's empowering, God's equipping, and God's provision in order that you may face every challenge the season offers to you. And I hope I'm going to get an amen pretty soon. What is Paul saying? You have no reason to give up because whatever challenge the world offers you, God gives you something far greater than what you need. He doesn't just give you enough, He gives you more than enough. Isn't that awesome? And that's why Paul was able to go through those trials and those difficulties and he was able to rejoice in that because he knew that when the poor boy hits the fan, God is going to give him far more than he needs to face that challenge. Now that blows my mind. In fact, in his first letter to the Corinthians, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 13, and he said, And God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted or tested beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, He will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Trouble flows in, God's empowering overflows. It flows in and He gives you so much. He gives you more than you need so that it actually overflows out of your life. But did you notice what Paul also said in verse 4? That He comforts us in all our troubles. We have no reason to give up. Because whatever challenge comes our way, God is going to give us more than we need to face that challenge. We know well that Paul pleaded with God to take the thorn from his flesh. Lord, take it from him. We're not sure what it was, but it caused him great suffering. And God responded and he basically said, Paul, my grace is is sufficient for you. I will give you more than you need to live with that thought. And as a result of that, Paul was able to rejoice in a valley church. I don't know what 22, 22, 2022 holds for you and for me. But what I do know is it holds trials and challenges and difficulties. But what I also know As they flow into your life and my life, God's empowering, God's equipping will flow in as well, but it will flow into such a measure that it's going to overflow. Now that's good news. That's hope. As we begin this year, I look ahead at the the church program, the, the building of the new church. In the next month or two, we're going to get the costings from our, our quantity surveyor as to what the building project is going to cost us. And we're going to be faced with a challenge. But as the challenge flows in, so God's equipping, provision, empowering flows in and overflows as well. So Valley Church, whatever 2022 holds for you, God will give to you more than you need to deal with it. So to quote my good friend Winston Churchill, never, never, never give up. One of the reasons why we give up is when we think about the challenge that lies ahead. We feel like we cannot cope. But you see, one of the secrets is that God only gives you grace in the situation. It's only when you are in the crisis that God's comfort and God's equipping flows in and overflows. Not before, but only then. It's about trusting that He will 
provide. So the first reason, God's empowering is always greater than any challenge we may face. The second reason, and the second key to overcoming, is that there is meaning and purpose in our suffering. Verses 3 and 4 and 6 and 7 are the key verses. One, I don't know about you, but one of the reasons, and one of the main reasons why I am tempted to give up, is simply I get to the point of saying, this is serving no purpose. This has no meaning. So why am I doing it in the first place? And therefore we are tempted to give up. Case in point, about three weeks ago I realized that my passport was about to expire in the next six months, which basically means I cannot use it. And so I realized that I would need to go to Home Affairs and apply for the renewal of my passport. Now you guys know, I've shared with you before, one of the things I detest in life is waiting in queues. And so I went online and I tried to do the whole thing online and got to a point where it just wasn't working and eventually I decided, well, the only way is to go and do it. And so on Monday morning, at five o'clock in the morning, I got in my car and I went over to Weinberg and quarter to six, I was standing in Main Road outside Home Affairs. Five hours later, I'd gone through the process. You say to me, how did you do it? The only reason I did it was that there was purpose in me. I knew at the end of it, for the next 10 years, I wouldn't have to do it again and I would achieve it. But if I was standing in that line and there was any doubt in my mind that I would achieve what I would not achieve what I wanted, I would have given up. And that is the reality of life. And so when we go through trials and difficulties, the lie is that this has no meaning and no purpose. And yet as Paul deals with it, he says, guys, don't give up because the trials and the difficulties you're going through have meaning and purpose in two specific ways. Firstly, they transform you. Paul makes it very, very clear that as you go through trials and difficulties, God begins to shape your character. He builds patient endurance in you. So as you deal with this trial, He's preparing you to deal with the trial that is going to come down the line again. That you are able to look back at this trial and say, you know what, I've been here before. You know what, I overcame in that situation and now I will overcome in this situation. We know those words so well in James. In that very practical book, James writes in James 1 verses 2 to 4, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. God uses trials and difficulties to shape our characters. To equip us and prepare us for the trials that are still to come. As Megs and I look over our journey in ministry and we look back at previous churches we've been in and even when we were living in faith at Bible College and we look back at the trials that we went through we are able to see that in that God equipped us to deal with trials that we are going through today. And so the trials and the difficulties have the purpose of shaping us. But secondly, they have the purpose of equipping us to help others who are going through the same trials. Paul makes it very, very clear there that God comforted them in order that they may be a comfort to us. God bless them in order that they might be a blessing to others. And that brings me to the third reason why we go through uh, suffering and trial. Is that we might minister to others who are going through difficult times. A guy by the name of Henry Nguyen who I discovered a few years ago. One of the more uh, contemplative Christian writers of our age coined the phrase, a wounded healer. And basically he said, as disciples of Jesus, we are all wounded healers. 
that as we go through trial and difficulty and we are wounded, so in that process we become healers as well as we are able to minister out of a place of woundedness into the lives of others who are going through difficulty. Eric Fromm was a Jewish psychoanalyst who grew up in Germany. When the Nazis took over, he was able to flee, but he did a study of those who overcame in the, the Nazi concentration camps. And he was fascinated by the fact that, that some people just gave up and died and did not prevail, and yet others were able to overcome. And he came to the conclusion that it was those who were able to find meaning and purpose in their suffering who were able to overcome. The only reason I overcame home affairs was that I knew after five hours I was going to get... Well, I haven't got it yet. In fact, hopefully in three weeks' time I'm going to get my pass. The verse of our season has been Romans 8, 28. And God works all things for our good. Even the evil that the evil one perpetuates, that God did not intend, God is able to take that and He is able to use it. There is meaning, there is purpose. You may not know what that meaning and purpose is. As I look across the congregation, I, I know that there are folk who have lost loved ones and it's very hurtful and painful. Maybe God has not revealed the meaning and the purpose, but He will one day. Because He's a good God. And in faith we trust for that. But then the third key to overcoming is that it's not about your ability, but God's ability. Verses 8 and 9. I give up very quickly when there doesn't seem to be meaning and purpose. But I'm sure you and I are also very tempted to give up very quickly when we look at a situation and we look at our ability, we look at our financial resources, we look at our physical ability. Perhaps you're running a marathon and you've still got 20 k's to go. You look at your ability, you look at the size of the challenge, and you come to the conclusion, my ability does not match the size of the challenge. And therefore, there is no purpose in continuing. And we give up. We simply give up. What does Paul say to us? He looks back at their suffering. And he says there, we were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure. What does Paul say? He came to the point of realizing that he did not have the ability to face the challenge that he was facing. But then notice what he says a little bit further. But this happened that we might not rely on ourselves, on our ability, but on God who raises the dead. What is Paul saying? He's saying, I learned the secret that it's not about my ability, but it is about God's ability. And what does he say about God's ability? He is the God who raises the dead. Paul comes and he says, I was able to overcome I did not give up because I realized it's not about what I can do, but it's about what God who raises the dead is able to do both in me and through me. And I want to say to you, and this relates to the first point, that God will give you more than you need to face the challenge. As you go into this year, as we go into the church building program, where we are at the moment, we do not have the ability to make that happen. As you look at the challenges that this year holds for you, perhaps you're at the point of saying, I don't have the ability to meet this challenge. Now you have a choice. You can choose to give up, or you can choose to rely on God. 
and to depend and rely on the God who raises the dead. Maybe your dreams have died. God can raise those dreams from the dead. Maybe your hopes have died. God can raise them from the dead. It's not about your ability. It's about your availability. It's not about your ability, but it is about God's ability. The God of the impossible. That's what it's about. And therefore, when it is about God's ability, there is no reason to give up. Megs and I have seen it in our lives, in the life of our family, where out of nowhere, the God who raises the dead suddenly breaks through. And the first thing we say, this has nothing to do with us because we've realized our ability could not do this. It is God. It is God. My time is almost gone, so let's get to the fourth key that we need to understand. If we are going to overcome, if we're going to resist the temptation of giving up. And the last one is simply this. We need to understand the power of prayer. We need to understand the power of prayer. Verses 10 and 11. Paul says, He has delivered us from a deadly peril, and He will deliver us again. On Him we have set our hope, and He will continue to deliver us. Paul experience deliverance from the trials and the difficulties that he and Timothy went through. He experienced God breaking through. And the reason for that, what does he say? As you help us by your prayers, we will give thanks on our behalf for the gracious favor granted us in answer to the prayers of men. We go back to our good friend James, in James chapter 5 and verse 16, where he makes that profound statement, the prayer of a righteous man is powerful and effective. Why? Because when we pray, we enter the throne room of the God who raises the dead, the God of the impossible, the God who is able to give to us more than we need to face any challenge this year holds for us the power of prayer. There is no greater power in all of the universe than the power of prayer. And because of it, we do not have the right to give up. Because while we are praying, the God of the impossible is able to break through in the most powerful and miraculous and amazing ways we can ever imagine. And so four keys, four keys to overcoming, four reasons right at the beginning of this book as to why we should never give up. God's empowering is always greater far greater than any challenge we will face. God's word says where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. He's more than enough. We, it was amazing, some of those worship songs, Christ is enough. Some of those worship songs we sang just dovetail with what God's word is for us. The 9th of January 2022, you might be tempted to give up on the year already. Saying to you, don't give up because He will give you more than you need to face this year. Secondly, there is meaning and purpose in the trials that you will face this year. You may not know what they are, but because we have a good Father, a God who is able to work all things for our good, we believe that. Thirdly, and guys, this is key, it's not about your ability. What did Paul say? A little bit later in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 10. He said, that is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, 
When I come to the place of realizing my ability is not enough, when I am weak, then I am strong, because then I know it's about God's ability. I'm strong not because of my ability, but because of God's ability. And then lastly, we have no right to give up because of the power of prayer that is available to us. Prayer truly changes things. Because prayer is to the God of the impossible, the God who raises the dead. So Valley Church, those watching online, I really believe that God's word for us in this season is never given up. He's given to us four keys of overcoming. And they are very simple. The choice is ours, as it always is. Are we going to practice them? Are we going to trust and believe that they are true and they are real? And that will determine how we experience 2022 and the years which lie ahead. So friends, as we continue through 2 Corinthians, I'm excited about what God is going to say to us, how God is going to challenge us, and how God is going to encourage us and equip us to face what this year holds for each and every one of us. And so I just encourage you, as I always do, those watching online, perhaps after the service, perhaps when you get home, just to draw aside with the Lord for a little bit of time. Think about the challenges and the trials that you are going through right now. Perhaps those you know are still coming down the line. Perhaps take these four keys to overcoming and just allow God to minister them into that situation. And allow God to speak His hope and His encouragement into your life. Friends, if you're needing ministry after service, please feel free to come forward. There will be many who can pray for you. We'll practice social distancing. We won't lay hands on. But we'd love just to minister God's grace. So Lord, we thank You for this Word. We thank You, Lord, for this encouragement and this hope. Thank You, Lord, that we've been able to learn through the sufferings of Your great servant, Paul. Lord, I just pray as we continue in this journey over the next few months, that Lord, you would build our hope, you would build our faith, and that you will encourage us in every circumstance. As we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen and Amen. God bless.